Calling all detectives. When murder strikes at random, how would you go about protecting future victims? That is the problem on this page from my casebook. The casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. A man like me, Jerry Browning, private detective, is paid to take chances. And I do. But the one person I really fear is the compulsion killer. Six days of the week, 29 days of the month, the compulsion killer may be a mild, respectable man. But when his compulsion grips him, he's a cold, shrewd, heartless murderer. The victim was a middle-aged laborer, and like the others, he'd been shot from behind, probably never knew what hit him. There were six slugs in him, also in keeping with the meager pattern we'd established. Apparently, the killer always crept up behind his victims, fired the entire chamber of a six-gun into their backs, for reasons known only to his own warped brain. Like the previous murders, this one took place late at night when there was little possibility of witnesses. I walked over and watched the stretcher bearers lift the body into the ambulance. Hey, Jerry, here's a bundle the guy was carrying and his shovel. Do we take these along? No, I'll leave them for the police. Okay, let's go. With the body gone, the crowd began to disperse. After a while, only a bundle of sweaty work clothes and a battered old shovel on the pavement indicated that here, a man had died. With the murder of a laborer on his way home, a compulsion killer chalked up his third victim. Stop the film! Back it up to that last shot! Freeze it right there! We were in the crime lab projection room, looking at on-the-spot films of the three murder scenes. The shot Dawson wanted to study was a camera angle of the second compulsion murder. A young woman who'd been killed while on her way home from an outlying country club. The picture showed her body sprawled face down on the sidewalk, her golf bag nearby, and in the foreground, a large metal sign that said, Bus Stops Here. That laborer last night was killed at a bus stop, and the first murder, a uniformed policeman going off duty for the night, he was waiting for a bus too. Jerry, maybe we got something. I shrugged. Maybe. We know that a compulsion killer murders because something about his victim reminds him of some intolerable situation in which he's been. But this bus stop thing seems weak to me. If the killer had some terrible association with buses, he'd kill bus drivers rather than passengers. Well, you might be right. Okay, let her roll. It was three o'clock that same afternoon when I heard news over the radio. Another compulsion murder, this time in broad daylight, less than 24 hours after the murder of the laborer. And unlike the previous crimes, this one had taken place indoors. The scene of the latest murder was a room in the Harley Woodridge Hotel for men. The victim was an elderly man who'd been shot in the back, as had the three previous ones. He was sitting here at a table playing solitaire. The man who lives next door, Paul Jordan, heard the shots, ran in here, but by then the killer was gone through that window. The window, wide open, led to a fire escape and down six flights to a court. I'm going down the fire escape. Don't let any of your men take a shot at me. I went down the fire escape three flights. And then I paused. The ladder leading to the flight below had been freshly painted, and there were no footprints on it. I retraced my steps, went on up to the roof. There was a roof door leading back downstairs, except that it was rusted so tight that I couldn't budge it. By the time I got back to the murder room, the body was gone, and with it, most of the cops. Dawson was waiting for me. Find anything, Jerry? I shook my head, bent down, and picked up a few of the playing cards scattered on the floor. Are these the cards the old man was playing with? Yeah, why? I shrugged. I don't know. Picked up the rest of the cards. Started laying out a hand of Canfield Solitaire. Turned up two hearts, a spade, three diamonds, and on the seventh pile, a club. I stared at the layout. Dawson, I'd like to talk to that man next door, Paul Jordan, the one who heard the shots. You wait here. Get 
Jordan was a tall, thin young guy of about 25. After I told him who I was, he invited me into his room. The walls of the room were decorated with pasted-up pictures of dogs cut from newspapers and magazines. Dogs are my hobby, Mr. Browning. I used to have one back home in Cleveland when I was going to school. Oh, there's no friend like a dog, Mr. Browning. I met his intense, searching gaze squarely. You're right, Mr. Jordan. And anybody who'd hurt a dog is nothing but a brute. Jordan smiled at me. I can see you've owned dogs yourself. He waved me to a chair. There should be more people like you, Mr. Browning. I sat down, and we talked for a couple of minutes about the murder next door. Jordan identified the victim as Charles Ackerson, who'd once mentioned that he was a bookkeeper. He was a nice old gentleman. Why should anybody want to kill him? I reached into my pocket, took out my blackjack, dangled it from my fingertips. It was a compulsion murder, Mr. Jordan. Those things don't make sense to the ordinary mind. I'll give you an example. This blackjack, for instance. What does it convey to your mind? Jordan looked intently at the weapon. You defend yourself with it, as you might with a revolver. I nodded. You're right. It's basically a weapon of defense in close quarters. But it can also be a weapon of offense. You could beat a man or a dog to death with this, as you could with a club, as you could with a policeman's billy, a woman's golf club, a laborer's shovel. <laughs> I was expecting it, but he was on top of me so fast and with such furious strength that I couldn't handle it. He had his fingers around my neck and was choking me like Dawson dashed him. Tore him loose. Between us, there was all we could do to subdue him. Yeah. We had our compulsion killer. He'd been a lonely boy once. His schoolmates thought him peculiar, wouldn't admit him to their clubs. And then somebody clubbed to death his only friend, his dog. Now clubs had become his compulsion. He had to kill people who were carrying objects that reminded him of a club. Why did he kill his next-door neighbor? For the same reason. The old man was playing solitaire when Jordan dropped in to visit him. Jordan was keyed up over the previous night's killing. And when the old man kept talking about his solitaire game, kept mentioning the club suit, all the old hatreds welled up in Jordan again. And he killed again. Like I said, no matter how deeply hidden... There's a motive for every crime, even for the crime that seems without a motive.